I'm going to begin this morning talking about uh, the identity war. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Father, in Jesus' name, we acknowledge your presence in the room, not just to make us feel better, but to bring change to our lives. God, we ask you that the angels of God will hand deliver the message by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Let me just begin by saying that oftentimes when we deal with these things, the church over the years has not always done a great job of managing these subjects. We have various responses. One of those responses is to yell. We just get mad and we start yelling. Uh, we yell at the television or we yell at the news or we end up yelling at people. I want us to understand that we love people. We're, yeah, that's a great, thank you for that one amen, appreciate it. Um, your enthusiasm is overwhelming. We love people. This is why Jesus came, for God so loved the world, the people in the world. We love people. So yelling about something is, is one of the reasons the church has looked at it so judgmental because we don't know how to communicate it. We're either all grace, 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 or truth, truth, truth. And in fact, Jesus was full of grace and truth. He had the perfect balance of both of them. So, so yelling is not really the greatest uh, response we can have. Another response that believers have is not just yelling, but is yawning. Oh, well, whatever. I got my life to live. I've got important things to do. Let people live however they want to live. Well, we're called to have an influence in culture and engage the culture. We're not to be yelling and we're really not to be yawning. Uh, if you're sleeping, then uh, you're sleeping through some of the most significant times in history. Uh, so I wouldn't suggest that we yell. I also wouldn't suggest that we yawn. I want to I wanna give you a perspective that maybe we should be yearning. Yearning for Jesus to reveal himself. Yearning to know the Lord, yearning to grasp a hold of him and his, his grace and his strength and asking God to do something in a culture that is very, very broken. I also want us to understand that many of the moral battles of the day are being fought on the political battlefield and we think that's where the real battlefield is. Now, some of the things that we'll talk about today are in politics, but I'm not talking about politics today because we don't have a political battle going on. We have a spiritual battle uh, that is going on, and you have to decide what battlefield that you're going to get on. And if you're on the wrong battlefield, then we'll be unable to move forward and, and bring solutions. Understand with me that whoever controls the thinking controls the culture. This is why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every thought that brings itself against the knowledge of God. That's where our battle is, and whoever is controlling thinking is controlling the culture. And oftentimes the church has given up that responsibility so that other individuals do it. And I want to suggest that it's time for the church to get back in the role of influencing the thinking of culture. Uh, and then many of the things that we'll talk about today are very personal to our family and will be very personal to some of you. So we're not speaking about things from a distance. So a while back, I had forgotten uh, neglected to get my tags updated, do the inspection and get my tags updated. And so what do you think happened? I'm driving on 70 up here and the sheriff's department pulls me over and uh, gives me a ticket. But he writes on the top of the ticket, nice guy. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> he was really nice. And sometimes they do that, I've been told. So when it goes through the court system, they uh, might be a little more lenient on you. 
um, just to know that you weren't a jerk uh, to the officer when he, when he pulled you over. But the fact that I was a nice guy did not lessen the consequences of my actions. I want you to understand that everybody in the room gets to choose our actions, but we do not get to choose the consequences of our actions. Okay? And so what we have done within our culture is that we have leaned into the emotional side of things. So let's, let's assume for a minute that uh, I'm a serial bank robber and I've robbed a bunch of banks and they finally catch me and in the interview room, they get done talking to me and they go out and they say, wow, he's a really nice guy. I don't think we should charge him. <laughs> or let's say that, that I'm a, God forbid, a serial killer. They finally get me, and they interview me, and they say, well, he's so, he's so easy to get along with. He's so, so nice to talk to. Would the fact that I was a nice person lessen the consequences of my actions? Well, no, but this is what we've done in our culture. We've looked at the personalities of people. We've said that, well, they're, they're really nice. They're kind people. And so what we've done is we have leaned into the emotional side of this instead of dealing with the root issue of the spiritual side of this. So let's just begin real quick and, and put us, putting us on some of the same page here just so that we review some of the more current things that have been happening in our culture. North Carolina parents outraged over school's Satan club. Now, now, I will say about this that uh, if the students on that campus were full of the Holy Spirit, the Satan Club wouldn't be an issue, but that's a different discussion for another day. Pro-life activists arrested for praying silently near an abortion facility. Parents take action against the school board after kids assign sexual fantasy essay. After six people were murdered at a Christian school, the media relentlessly smears prayer and religion. And the DOJ, the FBI, labeling Catholics as violent extremists under scrutiny after leak. Tampa residents speak out against school district sex ed curriculum, calling it to be removed. Chicago school's watchdog finds hundreds of employees groomed and sexually assaulted students. Sam Britton helped craft model school policy, keeping parents in the dark about kids' gender change. Battled Virginia School District bars teacher from using a Bible verse in the email. Florida Sheriff calls for a societal change after three juveniles were charged in a triple teen murder. Animal tranquilizer mixed with fentanyl. Rot skin and turns humans into zombies. The Walking Dead and Hickory, North Carolina makes the list for the worst cities in the United States for opioid abuse. Trans Biden administration official says changing kids' genders will soon be fully embraced. The state advances trans refuge bill that critics say would strip custody from parents. Transgender adults strip naked in Dutch television for question and answer with 10-year-old children to promote sex changes. Oregon denies Christian's mother adoption request over stance on gender. And on and on and on it goes. So let's go back for just a moment and see if we can't gain some understanding about how God originally set this up in the book of Genesis chapter number one. So God created mankind in his own image. I want you to understand that you are created in the image of God. How you are right now as a male or a female, that was not somebody's Mistake, that was not somebody's general idea. This was God's idea. You're a man because God created you to be a man. You're a woman because God created you to be a woman. It is God's identity within you and God's identity within me. He created them male and female, and then God blessed it, and he said, be fruitful and increase in number. In other words, duplicate what I have created. Duplicate my image duplicate my identity. Now, we often don't think about this, and we don't know exactly what age that Adam and Eve looked like when they were created. Let's just say that they looked like they were 25 years old. Oh, to be 25 again. And 
Let's just say that they looked like they were 25 years old. So if I'd have walked into the garden, you'd have gone into the garden that day, you'd have seen a 25-year-old person, but not really, because Adam and Eve were created with the appearance of age. So when you saw them, you were thought they were so old, but they were really like one day old. It is at this point of innocency when Satan comes in. And he says to Adam and Eve, did God really say? Now, this wasn't just about the tree. Is anything that God said accurate? And he puts the mind, the question in the mind of Adam and Eve, is God truthful? Is God trying to withhold something from you? Is God just some big ogre in heaven somewhere? And keep in mind that they were communicating with God on a regular basis. Every day the Bible says that God would go down in the cool of the day and have a conversation with Adam and Eve. And it is at this point of innocency, and this is why the devil always attempts to get us either pre-born or after-born because the devil doesn't really care where he upsets it as long as he grabs a hold of the innocency of the child or the innocency of a person early on in life. So just to underscore this, remember what God said about how we were created, Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. Who did this? You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. In other words, God was doing something on the inside of us, inside the womb where nobody could see it. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God was intentional. It wasn't this haphazard, random thing that God said, I'll throw a few pieces together and create a human. God was entirely intentional with you and with me. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. God had a plan long before you did. God had a plan before your parents. God had a plan even before conception. He wrote it in a book. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew the giftings. He knew how he wanted to direct your life, which, which, which is why the devil comes at us over and over again to try and throw us off the track of what God's plan was. Your days were ordained for me, written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. God's thinking good thoughts about us. Not bad thoughts. You may think bad thoughts about yourself, and that's what the devil does to us. Others may be saying bad thoughts about you. You might as well throw that stuff out. I was talking with LJ earlier, and you know what you need to do with childlike faith, with some of the stuff that comes to our head that doesn't agree with God? Just go to the devil and say, that's not what God says about me. Let me show you what God says about me. His thoughts to me are precious. How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. God would tell Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, even before you were conceived, I was watching for your life. Before you were born, (laughs) you see, this was not some kind of accident. Before you were born, before I was born, God God set us apart and he appointed to Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. What is he saying? He's saying that God had a plan long before you and I could ever think about having a plan. Now, what is that plan all about? Where is that identity? It's not just in being male or female, but it is an identity in Christ. Paul would say this, even as he chose us in him, God chose me. God chose you. God made a decision to love you. God made a decision to call you out. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation, before the world was even created, you were on God's mind. Before he put the stars in the sky, before the sun began to shine and the moon began to give its light, there was a God in heaven that was thinking about you, thinking about your purposes, thinking about your future. You were the the high point of God's 
creation. Yeah, he created the earth, but he saved the best for last. And that was you, and that was me. And God put man in a garden and began to fellowship with him. He chose me even before he decided to create the world. Now watch this in Ephesians 2. Paul will say, as for you, you were dead at one time in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. That was a prior time in your life and you were, he was the ruler of the kingdoms of the air. That's who you were following, the ruler of this world, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. This is a spirit we're talking about. This is something going on that's spiritual. This is something that is supernatural, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings and desires and leanings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who saw us before the foundation of the world, God who, God who saw that we were going to have an issue, God who saw that there was a sin problem, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you have been saved. And then what did God do? God raised us up just like the resurrection of Jesus. God said, I'll duplicate it in them and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Not for some future time, not a thousand years from now, not a million years from now, but in Christ, your identity in Christ right now is seated with Jesus on his throne. What does that mean? It means that you're above stuff, not beneath stuff. Some of us walked in the room today feeling like we were under something. Just let me help you understand your identity. You're not under anything today. You're not under any temptation. You're not under any issue. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter what your mind's telling you. It doesn't matter what the devil tells you. It doesn't matter what other people have said about you. You are not under. You are over. You you are seated with Christ in a heavenly realm far above all principality and power. Why? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. I'm his tapestry. I'm his masterpiece. I'm his painting, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is my identity. So then, be careful, beware that no one distracts you or intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they're filled with endless arguments of human logic for they operate with humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindset of this world system and not the anointed truths of the anointed one. For he is the complete fullness of deity living in human form and our own completeness is now found in him. <laughs> Do you understand? Now, if we don't have this, if we don't understand this, we get this. Uh, I noticed in your written testimony, you, you said that you use she, her pronouns. You're a medical doctor. What's a woman? It's important for you to understand why I said I use she, her pronouns. Well, I, 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 I understand I, 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 that there I'm explaining, are people. I was explaining why I'm asking the question, but I just thought you could answer the question. What's a woman? I think it's important that we educate people like you about why we're doing the things that we do. 
And so the reason that I use she and her pronouns is because I understand that there are people who become pregnant that may not identify that way. And I think it is discriminatory to speak to people or to call them in such a way as they desire not to be called. Thanks for that. So it's important that we respect each individual person. Are you going to answer my question? Can you answer the question, what's a woman? I'm a woman. And I will ask you, which pronouns do you use? Can you can you? If you provide, tell me that you use she and her pronouns, that, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to call you Mr. Bishop. I'm going to respect you for how you want me to, to address you. I, I'm just saying, so you give me an example of a woman. You say that you are a woman. Can you tell me, otherwise, a, can you tell me what a woman is? Yes, I'm telling you, I'm a woman. Is that as, as, a, as comprehensive a definition as you can give me? That's as comprehensive as the def- definition as, as I will give you today. I because see. I think that it's important that we focus on what we're here for, and it's to talk about access to I abortion see. So you're not interested in answering the question I ask right unless, and answering a question that I ask unless it's part of a message you want to deliver. Is that right? I'm sorry. You're because not, I was talking and you were talking yes, at the ma'am. same I, time. Yes, ma'am. I'm right. I it's my, hear it's you. my time. <laughs> Okay, it's my I just time think, to ask you questions. That's the purpose of it. I ask you to, to uncover things by asking you questions and asking you to respond. So you're not willing to answer a question unless it's part of a message you wish to l- deliver. Is that correct? Sir, what I was trying to explain to you is that I had a difficult time hearing you since we were talking at the same time. Right, let me just see if I can go to Ms. Arambide. Is that a pretty close approximation of the pronunciation? Arambide. Arambide. Okay. Um, what do you say a woman is? I believe that everyone can identify for themselves. Okay. Um, do, do you believe then that men can become pregnant and have abortions? Yes. So let's see if we can understand exactly what is going on here. Some of you may be familiar with something that the Israelites, God's people, became involved with called Molech worship. So Molech worship was the sacrificing of babies, but the sacrifice was done in this way. They created this type of idol, and in the lap of the idol, there was a fire that was burning, and they would play the drums very, very loudly. And the reason for that was to drown out the cries of the babies. And they would take the babies and they would throw them on the fire now, uh, and sacrifice them. Now understand that this wasn't just a belief. This wasn't just an act. And in our day, this wasn't just a political belief. This was worship. It's important to understand that. Why? Because much of what you're seeing right now is just not someone's political belief. It is an act of worship. Because people's politics now, people's belief systems, have become their religion. And this is why, as you and I might be willing to die for Christ, this is why people are so intent on forcing certain belief systems because it's just not a belief system. It is their religion and it has become an act of worship. So where do we see this? What is the root of this? Where did this come from? So remember that when Satan is tempting Jesus in the garden, and this was the final temptation, and the Bible will say this in Matthew chapter 4, and again the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said this, all this I will give you. Now it was his to give. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the ruler of the kingdom of this world. We understand that. But what does Satan say to Jesus? All of this I will give you if you will what? What is he after here? Okay, if you will fall down and worship me. And of course, Jesus will say to him, away from me, for it's written, worship the Lord and and serve him only. It would be a good idea for some of us sometimes in the moment of temptation to say, get thee behind me in Jesus' name. But if Satan is worshipped, what does that make him? Well, Isaiah tells us the original goal of Satan was to be God. 
How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. This is Satan now. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will be like God. And of course, God said, no, you won't. Beep. <laughs> Understand with me, this is not like, we, we picture these battles between Satan and God, like God's on one side, Satan's on the other, and they're in the middle of this battle. Uh, that's not how it is. <laughs> that might be how it is for you and me, which is why we don't understand we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But God just went, boop, and cast Satan out of heaven, you shall be brought down to hell, he said, to the lowest depths of the pit. So if he's worshipped, that makes him God. But if he's God, what does that make him? The creator. Now, we know that Satan cannot create anything. The only thing that's saying, because he's not a creator, he's not omniscient, uh, all-knowing, he's not omnipotent, all-powerful. Okay? He's not all-wise, he's not all-powerful. We know he can't create anything. So the only thing that Satan can do is recreate what God has already created. So what you are seeing right now is the recreation of the image of God, the recreation of the identity of God in the image of Satan. Because Satan has no power by his word to create anything. So in order for him to recreate, he has to use a knife and drugs. And to come after the original identity of gender because he has to be God. And ultimately, he has to become a creator. Now, where's the real issue here? Revelation chapter 16 will give us some insight. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs that leapt from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. This is actually the unholy trinity. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but now you have the unholy trinity of the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits because, again, the only thing that the devil can ever do is imitate what God has already done. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against who? This is the root of the battle. The battle for identity. The battle for our children. The battle for the future is ultimately a battle against the Lord. Because if he thinks, he's not going to win this obviously, but if he thinks if I win that, if, if I can win the battle of gender, then I have become God. The ultimate battle is against the Lord. This is why people struggle. This is why people are confused. This is why our children are challenged. A battle against the Lord and the great judgment day of God the Almighty. Look, I will come as, as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed, watch this, are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. He's not just talking natural nakedness here. He's talking about spiritual nakedness because if I'm not clothed with the garments of salvation, if I'm not clothed with the armor of God, I am naked and exposed to a demonic culture that will recreate my identity in the image of Satan. Revelation 17 will give us additional understanding. One of the seven angels, and this is happening right now in our culture, regardless of where your theology is in the book of Revelation, you can see this already being formed. One of the seven angels who carried the seven bowls came and invited me, come, I'll show you the judgment of the great whore who sits enthroned over many waters, the whore with whom the kings of the earth have gone whoring. 
show you the judgment on earth dwellers drunk on her lust. In the spirit, he carried me out in the desert and I saw a woman mounted on a scarlet beast stuffed with blasphemies. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, which are religious spiritual colors, festooned with gold and gems and pearls. I will tell you, none of what we are seeing right now would be taking place if the entire body of Christ had said no many years ago. She held a gold chalice in her hand, brimming with defiling obscenities, her foul fornications. A riddled name was branded on her forehead, great Babylon, mother of whores and abominations of the earth. Watch, watch what she's drinking here. She was drunk on the blood of God's holy people. Drunk on the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. See, this is where Satan takes the battle. See, the, the, the battle is not Washington. The battle is in the body of Christ. If the body of Christ does not get this, the battle is lost. It all comes back to us. You say, Pastor, what do, what do I do? Okay, I'm struggling with something. Or I know people that are struggling. Okay, let, let, let me just encourage you for a minute. Paul will say this, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You don't have to be a slave to anything. Okay. Anything that controls you, anything that drives you, anything that you're tempted with ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin for sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what do I do in the middle of the struggle? Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And understand with me that there is only one person in eternity that has the spiritual and supernatural authority to change our bodies but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lived Philippians 3 and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our savior he then then will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own this is not a gender change this is a supernatural change using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 So, what do we do? We're going to sit and yell. We're going to keep on yelling. Or we're going to keep on yawning. Or we're going to start yearning. for God to bring about change in us and change in our culture. You say, it's gone too far. You don't understand history. Where sin abounds, grace can much more abound. There, listen, everything that's going on in our culture right now, the power of Jesus died for on the cross and was resurrected. There isn't an issue that Jesus can't invade our culture with and deal with right now. So let me give you some action steps here. Okay, number one. The church must repent of its own sins before calling out the sins of a nation. If you're living with somebody, we love you, but you're living in sin. We will marry you. Go get a marriage license. And we'll have a ceremony next week right here. We would love to do that. Say, well, I don't really want to marry them. Then break up with them and get right in the eyes of God. Well, yeah, it's cheaper on my taxes for me to do that. Okay, good. You don't need the blessing of God? Fine. Hey, I'm sleeping with my girlfriend. I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. Stop it. I'm looking at porn. Stop. And it's not only sexual sin here that we need to repent of. It's the gossip. It's the offenses. It's the unforgiveness. 
It's the people that do this. It's the lack of giving to God and let everybody else do it. And spending our money on everything instead of giving what God asked to give to him. There's a lot of things. But I cannot yell at the world until I have taken a look at myself and say, God, what do you want to do with me? What do you want to do with me, Jesus? So I lose authority, remember, if I'm trying to deal with an issue in culture, but I got the issue in my own life, then I lose authority to be able to deal with it. Because I don't have authority with words. I only have authority with anointing of the Holy Spirit in the presence of God. My words don't bring about change. It is the authority of Christ that brings about change. And we're not talking here about perfection, but we are talking about people that are yearning for more of Jesus in dealing with their own issues. Number two, we have to regain our prophetic voice and stop being intimidated to speak up. Well, we don't want to say anything. They're going to talk about us. Okay. And that's a problem? This is why we say no to drag. Why? Because we don't like those people? No, we love people. It's because it is a misidentity. It's not the identity that God placed within somebody. And it is a misidentification of the identity that God placed in our kids. And this is why we don't want anybody doing that and saying, hey, you can do this because you can, you can be whatever you want to be. The, the most satisfied that you will ever be in your life is following after how God has created you to be. We say no to Dragon Newton, Hickory, Catawba County, across the nation. There have been a number of drag shows here. I just want you to know we say no because it's not your identity. Jesus has created an identity that he wants you to walk in. So we have to stop being in intimidated by anything that is contrary to how God wants us to live and the identity that he has given to us. Look at somebody and say, you've got Christ's identity. Look at somebody and tell them, you've got Christ's identity. Tell them, you don't need to live in someone else's identity. Number three, we, we have to speak Christ's identity over our lives and our family and friends. This is why it's important to speak it over our kids, over our families. What does God say? What does God say about you? What does God say about our children? What does God say about our grandchildren? What does God say about your spouse? What does God say about your friends? What does God say about your neighbors? We speak a lot of negative things over people. God wants us to begin to speak what he sees over people. Number four, we must put people in office who hold biblical worldviews. Really biblical worldviews, not just those that do it for political reasons, but who actually believe it and have a core in them, where you can find the core of what they actually believe. And number five, we have to pray for worldwide spiritual awakening, and it has to begin with us. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just wait for a moment in the presence of the Lord? So Holy Spirit, we ask you to do what we are unable to do. We want every part of your identity within our lives. May there be no part of our lives that does not have the identity of Christ in it. I want you to stand with me, and here's what we're going to do. First thing I want us to do right now is I want us to search your own heart. I'm going to let you take communion when you feel prompted of the Lord to do it. So first thing, Lord, we ask for personal cleansing. We don't look at anybody else, not the person beside us, behind us, in front of us, our spouse, our kids, anybody else. Lord, we search our own hearts right now. We want a deep, deep, deep cleansing, Jesus. A deep cleansing, Holy Spirit.
Now, we don't blame anybody else. We're, we're not bringing excuses to you, Jesus. They did, they said, if they would, if she would, if they would have, God, we bring no excuses and no blame to anybody. We humble ourselves before you right now, Jesus. Will you just search your own heart? Would you let the Holy Spirit search you right now? It's a bad thing to wake a baby up, but I'll let the parents deal with it later. Come here, buddy. Yep. This is Ezra, one of our two grandchildren. The devil hates this innocency. I want you to pray for the innocency of our children and grandkids right now. What's kids back in kids' church, nursery? There's a war on our kids, folks, but it's a war on God in his identity. I want you to lift both hands toward the Lord right now, and would you call out to the Lord? I can't do your praying for you. Would you call out to the Lord right now? Would you pray over our children right now, Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, come to us. Something's got to happen, folks. We need Jesus to invade our culture. When was the last time you prayed for the LGBTQ community with tears? Would you call out to God for them? Would you call out to every person who's transitioning their body from their gender and pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to them right now? We say yes to the identity of God. We say yes to the identity of God. We say yes to the identity of God. God, we pray for Newton, Hickory, Conover, Catawba County, in this region, God. We call out for the identity of God. Every bit of the identity, God, that you've placed in every one of us in this room, we call it out, Lord. We call it forth in Jesus' name. We call it out in Jesus' name. We call it out, Lord. We call it out, God. Now, would you pray for awakening across America? It's our only hope. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle, folks. Battle's not in Washington. The battle's in the heavenlies. Would you call out to God right now for awakening across this country? <laughs> 